as with the previous videos, which also began by saying as with the previous videos, this is an ongoing series, so look at the past videos for a bit more context, or just skip ahead if you want to see the overload of graphs and information I've got for you. Thank you to the people who do actually comment. I mean, my content gets very little engagement. I've had my 3D prints up on Thingiverse since about June, and all have had plenty of downloads, I've never had a, a single comment or any real bit of feedback. It's a bit demotivating, so don't ever feel like you're wasting your time commenting, I really do appreciate it. This is about refinement. I've overhauled the testing setup in quite a few ways. Firstly, I've put down a foam surface for the model to actually lift off. It's about as flat and smooth as I can practically get without a lot more work. I had a look again at the distance sensor calibration. It was slightly off. Not much, but I thought I may as well fix it, so I did. The connection between the model and the parallelogram, which I still can't pronounce correctly, the connection between that and the linkage is now much better. There's a beam glued rigidly to the model and that's bolted rigidly to the stand. It's not perfect and I have a plan to maybe really beef up the linkage but it's a lot better than it was. I also added more counterweight so it is practically perfectly balanced now. The weight of the linkage is about two grams, so I'm happy to call that ignorable. The first model is the peripheral jet hull, which is my reference model that I'm comparing everything else against. As before, I have a two battery ballast, so the weight on the testing stand is 808 grams, which I'm just going to call 810. Two things I've been asked are what difference does the internal duct make for the stability jet? And what happens if you tape off the stability jet completely? As to the second point, I'll get that out of the way just now. Uh, it's called a stability jet because if you block it off, this happens. Yeah, this is um, just time to curtail the test, I think. I'm not really learning anything here other than how easy it is to bend a bunch of bolts on the linkage with that much leverage. As for the internal ducts, I just ran it with and without. If you had asked me, I would have said there wouldn't have been a significant difference. The purpose of the internal duct, and I have to be careful here that I'm not going off on a, a diversion, a sidetrack, it was always to do with reducing turbulence on water. It produces a cleaner stability jet. I didn't consider it actually made a big difference to lift, but here we go. It does seem across the, especially the higher end of the lift range, you get a little bit of extra lift with the duct. It's not massively significant. You're talking maybe five millimetres, but it's there, it's measurable. I want to call back to the previous video and reference those results for the test hovercraft, which was also, I think it was about 820 grams or thereabouts on the, on the stand. My hover height recorded back then was about 50 millimetres and I'm not far off 70 in my most recent test. Now it's the same hull, it's practically the same weight, same motor and propeller. But the difference between 50mm and 70 that, that that's pretty substantial. Uh, and it's a real 70mm hover. I mean, you can see this oscillation here, but I have measured it. And both ruler and sensor agree that it's oscillating around 65 to 70mm. The obvious change is the flatter, flatter testing surface. The previous one was just sitting on the floor, which isn't actually particularly smooth when you really look at it. But there's another factor which, again, leads into an interesting sidetrack which I will perhaps cover separately, but I'll splice in a little explanation. I've been needing to relearn my animation, or in quotes animation, because this is the best quality you're getting from me just now. On this design, I've often shown it 
in CAD and in diagrams with the propeller lined up exactly with the top plate. But under power, that top plate will inflate and bulge upwards. The way I've drawn it in this animation, it wouldn't actually happen because the distance from the fixed top plate to the propeller cut out is so small. But given a large enough distance like there is on the testing model, if you build it with the propeller in what you think is the correct height with the propeller tip lined up, when it actually powers up and inflates, that propeller tip ends up below the cutout. So the other change I made to the testing model between the past video and this one is I printed another mount and raised the propeller up. It's only about 4-5 millimetres of difference, so it looked wrong when it wasn't powered with the propeller sticking up, but you could see when it inflated up it matched much more neatly. I think that's made quite a big difference and I'm thinking another test I'm going to run is mount the propeller at different heights and see how significant is it. The next test is the open rotor which is pretty self-explanatory. I've got the motor upside down with the propeller as close to the surface as I can get. I do have to be careful of cooling in this orientation but it's down to about 5 degrees in this workshop now, so it's not quite as bad, but for anybody trying to run tests like this, do monitor your motor temperature. I ran three tests on the open rotor. The first was just the rotor on that stand, and the weight of that was 170 grams. If I add the two battery ballast, it brings it up to about 520 grams, and after rooting around the garage and finding whatever stuff I could. Apparently this bottom bracket was just made for this. That brings the weight up to 810 grams, which is practically the same as the test hovercraft. That's always going to be my reference weight is 810 grams. I do notice with the open rotor, there's quite this up and down oscillation and it is actually because that testing stand is, if I say so myself, so good. There's practically zero friction, it is practically perfectly counterweighted, so there's no damping, I guess would be the term. So it's very prone to oscillate in and out of ground effect, which if we're going for some sort of ground effect rotor concept, I guess means that's what it would actually do, which may be telling us something already. The whole motor ballast counterweight assembly has quite some momentum when it gets going as well. All this is to say, this bouncing, I try and manually break it and there's a 10 second delay between the power dropping to the next measuring increment and the measuring actually starting. So that's enough time for me to try and get it settling as best as possible. The measurements themselves are 50 readings over 5 seconds and the 3 test runs so it tends to average out to a reasonably smooth curve but I definitely noticed these oscillations on the open rotor. Here is the results for the open rotor. The 170 gram weight, which was just the motor and nothing else, it's not really relevant. It's just when I first set this up, it's like I might as well test it anyway. The maximum height of the testing rig was just over 400 millimetres. And considering ground effect for this propeller will end at about 200 millimetres, so those points up at 400 are well out of ground effect and have truncated any power levels beyond those. Looking at the raw data for the 810 gram test, I don't know if the thrust multiplier concept really applies to an open rotor. It's based on the hovercraft where it is clearly hovering and in that case you can say the total upwards force is equal to the weight. But if it's not actually lifted off the ground then the thrust multiplier isn't really definable. Unless I measured the weight of the open rotor on the pad and noted how that changed as it powered up but that's no. I keep saying getting sidetracked. What I will say is the thrust multiplier for an open rotor, it's valid 
when it's lifting ground effect, for example, at 22 95 millimetres of lift is clearly off the pad, then the thrust multiplier can be calculated as it was for the hovercraft. Whether or not this is really an important result, the maximum thrust multiplier for a open rotor seems to be about 1.2 or 1.3 on the two battery test. And you could say, well, you know, 30% extra lift for free and ground effect. You could also say, well, the hovercraft can do 700%. It's not really that relevant to the test as a whole, I just thought I may as well calculate it. Next up is the ducted rotor. Making a good 3D printed duct is an entire project in itself and very easy to go off on sidetracks of tip clearances, bell mouth intakes, flow straighteners. I don't claim this duct is brilliant, but it is typical of what I would use you know, in an actual model. As with the open rotor, I did test it without any extra ballast at all, and then with the two batteries, and then with enough ballast to bring it to the 810 gram reference weight. Not much more to say on this. It seemed more prone to bouncing, especially in the quite low ground effect region. I'm speculating that the duct is cutting down on recirculation of air, which may actually be making stability worse, I don't know. But it did seem just bouncier on the pad, the kind of mass distribution with the batteries didn't help, but if you can't tell, I've not got much passion for the ducted rotor really, I just thought it would be nice to test. <laughs> There's the results anyway. Comparing it to open rotor of the same weight, the duct is actually worse. Not by much, but it just appears that a fairly simple duct isn't really offering you many advantages here. Again, it would be interesting to reduce the tip clearance and a bigger bell mouth intake and stators to straighten out the swirling airflow, but that, that's taking me away from the project, so if it's going to happen it'll be a different video. The next design is what I'm calling Open Plenum, although I've previously called this Simple Skirtless, which surely is just blowing the air down with a small perimeter lip, as you've seen with the hexagonal one. I built the Open Plenum very quickly, and I taped, just using my normal fibre tape, I just taped that rotor duct in and there was no other reinforcement and I spun it up and, spoiler, it doesn't lift off the ground even though it's thrust to weight. Okay, it doesn't leave ground effect even though it's thrust to weight is like 3. So feel free to skip ahead if that's all you're here for. The funny thing is that having just roughly taped it in, I then decided to glue it rigidly in and add a bit of stiffening to the open plenum, and that caused the duct to basically self-destruct. There was a horrendous like, resonance wobble, and it basically ripped the top of the intake apart. So I was left with a, it's still technically a ducted propeller, and it's still good enough for testing, but could I have done a better duct? Yes. But I've proven the, the point of open plenum, which is that even with a thrust to weight well above one, it simply cannot lift off the ground. Okay, well it can, but you know, it, it can't get up out of ground effect. This is the Ventura effect. And what it means is even with high thrust to weight, it's not a guarantee a hovercraft can actually get up out of ground effect properly or even to the edge of ground effect. One thing I did want to discover was how far above the ground does that open plenum need to rise before it breaks free of that suction effect and its thrust to weight actually allows it to leave ground effect. So I rigged up a very quick support and just progressively cut the height down. The lowest height at which it could lift itself away from the ground was 10 centimetres. 
and even then it was very marginal like you could see maybe it doesn't show up well on video but you could just see and sense the the fight going on between direct thrust which is trying to get the thing up and the residual ventura effect trying to suck it back down and indeed 10 centimeters was the last point at which direct thrust could win eight centimeters it would not do it it was just stuck there there is something interesting about that 10 centimeter figure and i'm just going to going to put this away and maybe come back to it. The open plenum is 60 by 60 centimetres, so 10 centimetres is approximately 15% of that width. As I said, I'll just stash that number away. A final measurement I made, which some may find interesting, when it escaped from the 10 centimetre limit, The power I measured was 95 watts. If I go to my thrust function, 95 watts correlates to 555 grams of open air thrust. What is the weight of this open plenum? On the pad there, with no extra ballast, it's 330 grams. That means it needed a thrust to weight of 1.7 to escape that 10 centimetre height and again the maximum thrust to weight of this with no extra ballast which it didn't add was near enough 3. Interesting. The next design is something I haven't actually tried before and I'm calling it annular jet. It's very similar to peripheral only the air is exiting downwards in a broad jet rather than inwards in a narrow jet and I know that this design isn't very efficient in terms of turning that airflow down but I think if you're looking for efficient turning of airflow you're perhaps on the wrong channel. In all seriousness there is a a logic, put that in quotes if you'd like, behind this design. I am thinking of ways to control the split of airflow between the stability jet and the peripheral jet. One idea is to stick with the peripheral jet design and open up the stability port. I'm thinking a kind of trap door mechanism where it would just open and with that fully open the thrust from the propeller is just direct, there's no peripheral jet effect. The other idea was to kind of invert that and think what if I kept the stability jet as it was but I opened up the sidewalls? Before I got too far ahead thinking about the mechanics and design of all this, I thought I'm going to at least try the concept. Is there anything to this? There is actually two annular designs on test, so the one we're looking at right now, I'm just going to call it Wide Jet. And there's a bit of a debate could be had about, well if I'm saying this is 60 by 60 centimetres which is my testing size, should that 60 by 60 be the base plate or should it include the very wide annular jet? For this one the overall dimensions are actually 80 by 80 with a 10 centimetre wide annular jet. I did add the propeller duct It gave better results on the peripheral one, so I thought, it's there, I'll just add it on. You know the drill by now, I did a test run with no extra weight, which was about 400 grams on the pad. I then added the ballast to bring it up to the 810 grams testing weight. I did notice my data was a little bit wobbly, I don't know if it was vibration. It's not unusable by any stretch, but I did notice one of the curves was slightly off. There's an interesting comparison with peripheral jet, which I will put towards the end of the video. If I go back to the idea of the pivoting sidewalls then, if I went with this configuration, the sidewalls would actually extend below the base plate. I ran the tests again with a a short extension, you can see it here, and this is a kind of weird design where you've got 
the interior plenum, the pressure chamber, but you've also now got a kind of open plenum underneath it as well. It's almost like a hovercraft on a hovercraft if you look at it. Here's the results and again there's an interesting comparison to peripheral jet but I'm going to do that separately near the end. This is just the annular wide jet extended results right now. The next design I'm calling hollow plenum. You could view it as the open plenum just with much deeper side walls. And if you haven't guessed from the very short length of this section, it doesn't work. Which really, really surprised me. I understood why the open plenum, just a very flat one, doesn't work. You've got your Venturi effect, etc. I really thought whole plenum would just lift off. But it is just stuck there like open plenum was. Yes, you can manually wrench it away from the ground and then works as you would expect, but I haven't done any actual testing. I mean, what's the point in doing the power lift curves for this? I also probably should have done the test of the, the breakaway height and thrust away, etc. But I, I could see it didn't work, so you're not getting that. The last design on test is also an annular design and it may look like I just took that filled whole plenum and modified it to have an annular jet. That is exactly what I did. And I'm glad I tested it because this is among the most interesting results I have. Once again I tested it with and without ballast and with and without an extended sidewall. And I included the stability jet duct as well, which is to be consistent with the rest of the tests. The most interesting thing I've seen doing this is this. This is the annular narrow jet extended wall, no ballast. And if you're struggling to keep track of this, just imagine how I feel. What's so important here is this is the only hovercraft design which has actually been able to lift up and escape the ground. It does not have a huge amount of upwards thrust and it's kind of riding on the very very edge of ground effect maybe, but it's done far better than any of the other hovercraft designs which couldn't even come close to doing this. I would say we are on to something interesting with this design. However, I will put up the thrust weight results which reveal something interesting, shall we say. Going by open air thrust, the thrust to weight reaches 1 at 58 watts and 52 millimetres of lift approximately. Beyond that point, it would make more sense to ditch the annular jet and just vent that propeller thrust straight down. However, remember our old enemy, the Venturi effect. At that hover height, I think just trying to go for direct thrust would just suck the thing back down. So I am coming around to the idea it is not as simple as all oh, the thrust to weight exceeds one immediately jump to full direct propeller thrust. I'm not sure about that. Remember, it took the old open plenum a thrust to weight of about 1.7 to escape the Venturi effect. Anyway, the maximum thrust to weight going by open air thrust is a little bit over 2 and you know obviously a, a multi-rotor with a thrust to weight of 2 is just going to shoot straight up and this thing with a equivalent open air thrust to weight of 2 it's not rising with much power it's not it, it okay it's out of ground effect but only just and that implies there is enough air being redirected downwards that the direct thrust is actually enough to hold it up so you're I'm going to try and not confuse myself as well as my viewers your open air thrust to weight at that 177 watts is 2.2 but the actual thrust to weight is going to be maybe just over one which is why it can get to that high ground effect or out of ground effect range. I'll have some more thoughts and analysis on this towards the end but I am thinking if I 
do something very shocking and actually do a efficient design which turns the air flow down to the annular jet much more neatly, might we be able to improve this greatly? I'm going to awkwardly push this into this part of the video. I did rerun the peripheral jet hull without ballast, which isn't something I've actually done before. As you can see here, it became really quite unstable. Now, given the readings being averaged off the sensor in the three runs, it actually still produced a perfectly usable curve. I will be using peripheral jet no ballast in the upcoming comparisons, this is just a quick bit on where it came from.